Important facts about concussions and suicide. Doing nothing only causes human beings to be idle and leads to them coming up with imbecilic thoughts and deeds that are of low intelligentum and that cause them to deteriorate and fall prey to all kinds of addictions which frequently also end in suicide. And while I am talking about this it occurs to me that I once almost committed suicide as a boy not because I fundamentally intended to do so but because I had not thoroughly thought about how parachutes actually work. So the whole thing was not intentional but recklessly inconsiderate when I jumped off the roof ridge with an umbrella during the time of the last world war. What your father Svahov said about it back then was that I was lucky not to have suffered a concussion because such is not harmless but would always in any case more or less result in brain damage which could lead to an increased risk of suicide. About that I would now like to ask how dangerous concussions really are since, as a rule, they are commonly played down. Right at the beginning of our conversation. You bring up a subject that needs some explanation, however, which I would like to elaborate on. As you say, concussions are absolutely not as harmless as is generally assumed. Even many earthly physicians do not realize that any concussion already causes abnormalities in various sections of the brain that are irreparable. That was also the reason why my father examined you thoroughly when you jumped off the roof ridge with an umbrella as a young boy, because you inconsiderately wanted to imitate what you had observed with parachutists. We have already talked about this before, namely at our 633rd official conversation on the 25th of October 2015 Pleiadian Pleiaran and Contact Reports, Block 14. Page 357. What I want to explain now corresponds to our millennial medical cognitions, namely that even one single concussion causes the danger of suicide, while further similar incidents continuously increase the risk of suicide. The normally intellectually talented and rational human being is if he or she does not succumb to a psychic ailment suffer anxiety or cowardice or an impairment of consciousness and become sick of life and weary of life, full of the joys of living and stable in life, as a result of which he or she never concerns himself or herself with suicidal thoughts. In the case of concussions, however, precisely such brain damage factors rise and indeed already from one single concussion so that suicidal thoughts occur which are intensified in several forms. And it does not take much to cause concussions, in which case, however, many human beings do not even notice such concussions, as Fahoth said. For instance, when someone simply hits his or her head is hit on the head with a fist or with a hard object, or when, for example, haters are made in football, a so-called fur, as we call it, where the football in flight is being caught by a strike with the head and kicked away. That is right, but it does not necessarily have to be such hard headbutts that cause concussions, because for that, strikes with the flat of the hand are already enough. You mean slaps in the face, thus clips round the ears, and so forth? Yes, that is what you call these irrational forms of chastisement, which, however, are absolutely not harmless and cause concussions of the brain which, although slight, are nevertheless detrimental and usually not ascertainable, but are sufficient to create the first suicidal impulse, which, according to the earthly wrong form of education, is usually followed by further ones and thus promotes the suicidal tendency. This is one of the reasons why so many cases of suicide occur among the earthly population, but they are commonly attributed to false causes such as love sickness and anxiety attacks and so forth, whereas the actual origin, however, lies in brain damage caused by blows to or on the head. For this, even so-called slaps in the face, as you say, which are given on the cheeks and ears, are sufficient, which, however, concuss the brain and thus damage it, namely by causing and storing suicidal impulses which become reality after a short or a considerable period of time. 
Many suicides that lead back to such origins occur only after the passing of extended periods of time, and this up until old age. And as you said, all kinds of sepalic concussions inevitably also lead to disorders of the psyche and consciousness, as well as to anxiety, cowardice and weariness of life, and so forth. In addition to concussions caused by blows to the head, such as slaps in the face or headers at football matches, and so forth, some kind of concussion of the brain may similarly develop when experiencing a considerable shock or severe and prolonged anxiety. In this form, thought-feeling psyche-based brain impairments are caused in the form of cerebral vibrations, which effectively show the same effect as blows to or on the head. So then it is the case that slaps in the face already result in slight or severe concussions of the brain without these being noticed as is also the case with profound anxiety and frights. Yes, that is what I said. Then each subsequent slap in the face accumulates with the previous one or ones just as the effects of anxiety and frights accumulate which then one day namely sooner or later can in some circumstances result in suicide. Greg, but the resulting brain damage, which can become effective even to a minor degree, and indeed in any case, can neither be recognized by earthly physicians and other specialists, nor are they sufficiently educated that they would have cognizances thereof. Thus, in the first and foremost place, fundamental thought-feeling psyche-based disturbances arise, which are expressed in uncommon and antisocial behavior as well as in disinterest, workshiness, poverty of thought, and feeling as well as in belief and bondage, being out of touch with reality, and in all kinds of fanaticism and especially in all kinds of addictions, ranging from material factual concerns to pathological craving for pleasure, the abuse of alcohol, drugs and prescription drugs, and so forth. Probably no medical studies and teachings exist about this, therefore the medical practitioners have no way of knowing anything about it. Medical or psychological studies also leave out the fact that there are frequent mass suicides the actual origins of which are not far formed by the science, as although they have been relatively common since time immemorial. Also the fact that suicide can be contagious and epidemic which your father Svahoff has already mentioned is actually not known in the populations. Yes, what you say is indeed the case on every point, but on the epidemic-like increase of suicides it has to be said that the earthly science have indeed recognized this problem, yet they are having their difficulties in dealing with it. Effectively, with regard to suicides, certain forms and circumstances, presentations, images, descriptions and observations and so forth, cause suicide promoting psychosic illnesses in unstable human beings, and indeed also mass psychosis in unstable groups of humans. In this process, individual unstable human beings, as well as entire groups of human beings, experience a dissolution of their rationally and volitionally controlled behavior, which urges them to commit suicide, which is then committed resulting from a cognitive feeling psychic consciousness based loss of control. This happens to unstable human beings for many reasons, such as the direct or indirect co-living of an effective suicide, as well as through movies, images, stories, novels, emergencies, through ordinary accidents or multiple accidents, as also through catastrophes, through increased psychical pressure, through instinct impulsations, ego weakness, increased influenceability, as well as through mass hysteria, and so forth. As a rule, unstable human beings appear completely healthy to fellow human beings and also to studied psychologists and psychiatrists because they do not show any overt psychical illnesses as a result of which they are classified as normal, whereas they are, however, befallen by the ailment of liability, which, however, cannot be recognized by the so-called professionals because they are simply incapable of doing so. Thus, 
Only those human beings can be at risk of committing suicide who are unstable in a cognitive feeling psychic consciousness based form, which can hardly or not at all be seen in them, since they are considered fully healthy, but already fall prey to suicidal thoughts during a life crisis and frequently also put them into action. The issue of suicide affects many human beings, young persons and older ones, because young persons and many older ones are not grown up and developed such that they can rightfully be regarded as adults in terms of intellect and rationality, and consequently they are not life resilient, and are prone to suicide due to unstableness. Hence, for all unstable human beings the reasons for committing suicide are extremely manifold and in any case, however, absolutely unrealistic, susceptible, not steady, but susceptible to change, wavering, inconsistent, and easily upset, as well as pathological, unbalanced in terms of thought, feeling, psychic consciousness, and unstable. Moreover, libel human beings are sensitive, fragile, volatile, and in certain things also weak in character, instable, moody, and also inconstant. As a result of this, it can possibly be the case that a label human being develops the will to commit suicide which, like a rampantly spreading disease, can spread among one or many human beings who are also not thoroughly life-resistant. Therefore, even one single suicide can be effectively contagious, and one single suicide can lead to another one or to several ones or even to a great number of them. It should also be considered that the intensity of the perception of suicide is just as important as the degree of familiarity with the person committing suicide, because, as the result of his or her prominence, this person is at least through a suicide, which then finds particularly strong expression in libel human beings who worship other individuals through thoughts of imitating the suicide. I would like to say a few things about this and mention one, two or three cases that I have recently looked up again and that I have partly also followed on television and for which I have copied some information from the internet, that is to say Wikipedia, which I will annex of course denoting it to my explanations. I could still vaguely remember one particular case from your father's explanation on world history but which I recently was able to freshen up on television so that also the readers of the conversation reports will be able to somewhat understand the whole thing. One of the most famous cases occurred at the time when the Romans terrorized Israel sieging the former Jewish fortress of Masada, Hebrew Mezad, fortress in Israel at the southwestern end of the Dead Sea which I also know from my stay in Israel. Today this part of the former fortress is located in an Israeli national park named after it with the site of the former fortress being inscribed on the World Heritage List which to the best of my knowledge took place in 2001 if I am not mistaken. Being part of the Judean mountains, Masada is an isolated table mountain along the western edge of the Jordan Rift Valley situated between the Dead Sea and the Judean Desert. Isolated from the rest of the mountain massive by a wadi to the west it should be explained that a wadi represents a dried out river that only temporarily leads water after heavy rainfall namely when there is an unexpected and abrupt rise in water levels which is typically caused by severe thunderstorms although these can also take place many kilometers away and in a wadi the swelling waters come from a correspondingly large catchment. For this reason staying in a wadi most of which have steep banks can be perilous. Wadis can be found not only in Israel but also in other places around the world such as Namibia and neighboring countries where they are traditionally called rivers. The difference in altitude to the Dead Sea to the east is over 400 meters while the slope to the west is 100 meters high. The hill summit of Masada is formed by a plateau and the plateau was originally only accessible via three narrow mill tracks as it was shielded by rugged precipices on all sides. 
Basically, the fortress was built in three phases on the site of a smaller and several decades older fortress and that within 10 years between 42 years before Emmanuel slash 42 and 32 years before Emmanuel slash 32. The whole thing was commissioned on behalf of King Herod I the Great who was a Roman client king in Judea, Galilee, Samaria and the neighboring territories. This Herod is best known for the infanticide in Bethlehem, which is attributed to him in the Bible according to Matthew. He was born in Edom in 73 years before Emmanuel slash 73 B, after which he died in Jericho four years before Emmanuel slash 4 B, and was interred in Judea. His consort was Mariam, to whom he was married from 37 years before Emmanuel, slash 37 to 29 years before Emmanuel, slash 29. His children Herod Antipas, Herod Archelos, Herod Philippos, Herod Bothos were also his successors. Herod the Great was one of the most brutal and cruel rulers of the ancient the world and at the same time one of the greatest builders of his time in the area of conflict between Palestine and Rome. When he died his bier was made out of pure gold decorated with precious gems and covered with fabrics embroidered in different colors on which the corpse lay swathed in a crimson robe. On his head he wore a tiara and a golden crown while his scepter was placed by his right hand. The whole thing was the funeral of tremendous and rare splendor and ostentation. However, this event was not reported on until nearly four decades later by a Jewish-born historian named Joseph ben Jathitahu. This man was descended from a Jewish priestly family but after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans 70 years after Emmanuel slash 70 AD, he had taken out a Roman identity and henceforth called himself Flavius Josephus. He had made it his task to give the Romans an understanding of Jewish life that was as authentic as possible whereas he had not been an eyewitness to the funeral of Herod I the Great. His notes attributed to the fact that, as usual with him, he had meticulously researched everything and described the funeral procession, the arrangement of the cortege, the length of the route and the burial site in minute detail. There was only one thing that the historian known for the reliability of his reports had described very vaguely, namely the grave itself. Consequently, no one knew where his tomb was located for about two millennia, until on the 8th of May 2007, the Israeli archaeologist Ehud Netzer finally announced that he had discovered the grave. For 35 years he had been excavating around the mountain fortress of Herodium, but then the renowned archaeologist from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem found the gravesite, namely in the eastern flank of the approximately 60 metre high Herodium hill where Herod's either great the jewel choosing, brutal, cruel and colourful ruler and biblical find had found his final resting place. But as far as Masadair is concerned, this fortress was considered to be invulnerable in its time and after the death of Herod a Roman garrison was stationed there. The largely flat summit plateau measuring 300 by 600 meters in the shape of our humbus was easy to defend and was also an extremely ideal fortification site due to its location and the good visibility of the access paths. Under Herod's orders, the mountain was converted into a fortress, for he had a casemate wall, French casemat from Middle Greek, chisma, crevice, chasm, abyss, and Italian casemata, vault, built around the plateau, or more precisely, a vault in the fortress building protected from artillery fire. This casemate wall also featured around 40 towers and he also had a large number of other buildings constructed within the fortress wall including bathhouses, a commandant's headquarters, warehouses, palaces, horse stables, swimming pools, accommodations, among them also a northern palace, hewn into the mountain slope over several tires. All this offered a magnificent view over the Judean desert and, with its north orientation, provided the climatically most favorable position on the mountain in summer. 
The palace was built of limestone and was decorated with mural paintings in the Pompeian style as well as with numerous mosaics. The royal bathhouse was located on the east side of the whole structure. Large food storages were also built which was necessary to be able to defend the desert fortress for a long time and to be provided with food at the same time while twelve cisterns had also been dug on the northwestern slope which were capable of accumulating several tens of thousands of cubic meters of rainwater. The water was brought in through two aqueducts. It served as drinking water but was also used for the swimming pools and bath houses. Decades after the death of Herod I, the Jewish war against the Roman occupation took place 66 years after Emmanuel slash E.D. when the Roman garrison of Masada was caught off guard and conquered by a group of Sicarii. Sicarii means stabber, knife wielder, dagger carrier from the Latin sicca equals dagger. The Sicarii were a particularly militant wing of the Zealots, who were called the Zealots or Fanatics in Greek and Cane in Hebrew, which is a concept that was derived from the biblical person Pinches Ben, Eliza, a grandson of Aaron, who was a religious Zealot and who zealously advocated his God with a lance in his hand. The Sicarians particularly carried out dagger assassinations, which is where the name derives from. In the first century they were a Jewish group opposed to the Romans and their occupation. Their preferred weapon was a dagger, the so-called Sikhat. Later, rebels from various political groups settled on the site of the fortress, especially after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem by Titus in the year 70 after Emmanuel slash E.D. after which the new occupants erected a number of buildings including residential houses, a synagogue, a bakery, dovecotes, cave houses and a mikvah, that is to say, immersion bath. Hebrew mikvah, or plural mikvot, or from flowing together, the water of which is not for hygiene but for purification from ritual impurity through ritual immersion. Masada was besieged in the year 73-74 after Emmanuel, or 73-74 after Trist by the Roman 10th Legion and nearly 4,000 auxiliary soldiers under the command of Flavius Silva, that is to say, by auxiliary troops, Latin auxilium help which were auxiliaries of the Roman legions and which were constituted of allied peoples or inhabitants who were not Roman citizens and were recruited out of the relevant provinces. The Jewish Roman historian Flavius Josephus handed down the history of the siege of Masada in his History of the Jewish War, Belum Eudecum 7, 252-406, the commander of the Romans had the Masada mountain surrounded by a wall over four kilometers long, circumvallatia, which was secured by eight castellums of different sizes with remains of the castellums and the wall still visible to this day. Afterwards, the Romans raised a siege ramp at the lower western side of the fortress which extended to the walls of the fortress and which is still well preserved today. This ramp was partly raised on a natural geological elevation which shortened the construction process enormously. The Romans then brought up various siege engines and battering rams to the fortress via this ramp in order to break through the wall and to bring it down. The siege lasted seven and a half months as Farhoff had told me and which I can still recall. Infrequently claimed longer siege period therefore does not correspond to reality but to unfactual false law. In the records of Flavius Josephus it can be read that when the situation became desperate the besieged ones on Masada under the leadership of Eliza Benier decided they would rather die as free human beings than fall into the hands of the Romans. Legion relates that they decided a glorious death is better than a life of misery. I saw a few men were chosen by lot to mutually kill the population of the fortress and then themselves which is what actually happened then. Consequently, when the Roman soldiers stormed Masada they found nothing but a deathly silence and 960 dead men, women and children. And as the story goes, only two women and five children had stayed hidden and could report what had happened.
According to the records, the Romans admired the courage and the decision of the besieged. To this day, the suicidal act of the population of Masada is the symbol of the Jewish will for freedom. Then I will now move on to the second case I would like to cite which is that of the Johnstown mass suicide and mass murder in South America also known as the Johnstown massacre and the so-called mass suicide of Johnstown whereas the partially coerced suicide or murder of the members of the People's Temple sect took place on the 18th of November 1978 in the Johnstown settlement founded by Jim Jones in northwestern Guyana in which 920 three people lost their lives. In mid-November 1978 a mass suicide and mass murder, that is to say a sectarian massacre took place in Jonestown in Guyana, South America which effectively shocked the whole world when 923 people committed suicide or got murdered. The majority of all sect members had died in agony from cyanide poisoned lemonade, with many voluntarily following their sect guru Jim Jones who was increasingly under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs from the early 1970s onwards to their death while other victims however were shot dead. The leader of the religious sect was Jim Jones with the village in the jungle of Guyana also named after him. For his cult followers who had followed him from the United States of America to the South American jungle, paradise on earth was to become reality there according to his lies and his confused teachings of salvation and with it the dream of racial equality, social fairness and loving dealings with one another which however ultimately ended in a catastrophe. This sect guru Jim Jones came from the most destitute background while his mother believed him to be a messiah consequently supporting him in this form which led him to take up his first post as a sect preacher as early as at the age of 19. So the sect believers first followed him into the jungle and then to their death. This was also the case for U.S. Congressman Lee J. Ryan, who traveled to Jonestown on the 17th of November together with the parliamentary employees James Scollett and Jackie Spear, survived injured, and along with journalists and some apostate sect members for an inspection visit. This was because reports on sexual abuse of sect members by Jim Johns became more frequent as well as reports of unbearable working and living conditions as well as false imprisonment and torture in the muddled village of Jonestown. The gruesome images went around the world in those days showing nearly 1,000 dead women, men and children in the sectarian village of Jonestown scattered everywhere in the open. Effectively, it was one of the worst cases of sectarian mass suicides and sectarian mass murder of modern times in Christian religious sectarian human history where even babies were murdered by having the bitter poisonous broth squirted into their mouths. The charismatic founder guru of the People's Temple sect Jim Jones first threatened with words like, if we are not allowed to live in peace, we certainly want to die in peace. Then in a slightly drawling voice and wistful accent he spoke to his sectarian following and announced death is only the transition to another level through which the 47-year-old lulled the human beings and in this form tried to stifle the fears of and doubts about suicide. But this did not make sense to all sect members so a sizable number of them did not swallow the poisonous drink voluntarily and thus not all of them committed suicide which is why they were simply shot dead on the 18th of November 1978 and thus became victims of their god illusion belief. However, there were survivors of this massacre who later reported that the armed guards positioned around the assembly hall of the agricultural sectarian jungle colony made use of their firearms and shot several of the believers who did not comply with the suicidal order of Jim Jones. And in fact, dead sect members were then found who had been killed by firearms. That which initially appeared to be an indisputable mass suicide out of religious delusion was later in part explained as mass murder by survivors, particularly in relation to at least 250 killed babies, children and young persons. 
The Sek Guru, who mostly hid behind dark sunglasses, implored his followers in order to appease them with the lie that the suicide and murder massacre was not a suicide but a revolutionary act. Jones had initially tried to prevent the inspection visit on the 17th of November by the U.S. Congressman Lee J. Ryan together with journalists and some apostate sect members due to the increasing frequency of reports on sexual abuse of sect members by Jones, unbearable working and living conditions, as well as false imprisonment and torture in Johnstown. This, however, failed, hence Jones arranged a big party which at first gave the impression that everything was as it should be and in full harmony. After initial talks in the evening of the 17th of November 1978, he lied to the new arrivals and to the U.S. congressman. Here are people who think that the Jonestown colony is the best thing that ever happened to them in their lives, which was further corroborated by the sectarians with clapping and frenetic applause as it had been hammered into them. The next morning, however, shortly before Ryan's departure, the mood suddenly changed because overnight various sect members had changed their minds, hence first a few, then however more and more residents of Jonestown asked permission to leave the colony together with the politician, his people and the journalists. But for Jones, who had been increasingly under the influence of drugs since the 1970s, this was a hard blow and moreover an unforgivable betrayal, as a consequence of which, according to testimonies of survivors, he desperately shouted to those who wanted to back out and flee, you can't go, you are my people. However, when the believers did not tell the line in his sense, he became brutal and reacted such by immediately having his heavily armed guards threaten them on the 18th of November and force them to stay. And ultimately, just as the control delegation hated by the congressman was about to board a plane on the grounds of the sect, he ordered his watchdog team to open fire on Ryan and his companions, thus spreading death and ruin. The politician himself, who had previously been threatened with a knife by a sect member and five other individuals, were murdered by rifle shots at close range. After that, Jones definitely lost his head and continued to fuel the deadly atmosphere that he had long been impregnating and building up among his hangers and through constant anxiety, threats and intimidation, thus creating a kind of apocalyptic mood. So after he had the inspection delegation shot, it was then that he fell into a state of cowardly anxiety and maltreated his believers with the threat that U.S. paratroopers would now come and torture all of the believers, namely right down to the elderly and the children. Thus the whole thing increasingly and rapidly very badly got out of the control of the good human nature and thus it was inevitable that he and all his following eventually sank into a collective insanity. On tapes found among the dead was an audio recording of a woman who did not want to die, which is why she reminded Jones, the sect guru of his previous promise to migrate to the Soviet Union instead of committing suicide, to which, according to the recording, he abstrusely replied, I, as I will call that right away. After this lie, he drove the human beings to their deaths with Gavolt, continuously shouting in a quivering and agitated voice, hurry up my children, hurry up, while the cups of poison were passed around in quick succession. And the humans who drank the poison, as survivors reported, keeled over dead with foam at the mouth where they were standing or sitting. One of the survivors later said bitterly, that was no revolution, no act of self-determination. That was simply a completely senseless loss. I then in the Mydates Quetzal once explained to me the guy in his government decided that Johnstown should be destroyed after which it was completely burnt and razed to the ground. Then I will now move on to the third case which is also just another one in a whole series of similar occurrences all of which relate to sectarian machinations the circumstances of which are known to me with for example the following five cases which can be found in Wikipedia and not all of which are amply known to me except for that incident with the Solar Templars which was made public worldwide.
September 1985, 68 Hangjusen to a nature-based religious sect killed themselves with poison on the Philippine island of Mindanao. August 1987 in South Korea, 33 tied-up corpses are found in the attic of a factory. The investigations reveal that a fanatical female sect leader has led these humans to commit suicide and poisoned them. April 1993 at least 81 human beings burned to death at the Davidian sect's estate in Waco, Texas. Presumably the sect members set the fire themselves when the police stormed the premises after a 51-day siege. March 1997 the bodies of 39 members of the Haven's Gate sect are found in a luxury mansion in Rancho Santa Fe near San Diego, California. They had taken sleeping pills, alcohol and an opiate. Obviously they had believed in an extraterrestrial UFO when the comet Halbop appeared. January 1998 through intervention by the Spanish police, the collective suicide of 32 Hangerson of a German female sect leader on Tenerife is averted at the last minute. Also in this case, a UFO supposedly played a role. But what I want to talk about now is the affair with the Solar Templar sect lasting over four years and which took place in Switzerland, France and Canada starting in October 1994 and which was also headline news in the media across the globe. The Solar Templars, French Ordre du Temple Solaire, Oats wore ritual cult habits with the Templar cross and this sect was a radically world-rejecting, internationally active secret sect also referred to as a secret society. In the second half of the 20th century, this sect saw itself as a modern Rosicrucian order while also referring to the Knights Templar. As an apocalyptically oriented sect, it caused a worldwide stir, especially when 74 members lost their lives in four collective ritual murders and suicides in 1994, 1995 and 1997. The Solar Templar sect, that is to say, the Order of the Solar Temple, Order du Temple Solaire, Order International Chevalerescu de Tradition. Soler was founded by Joseph Di Mambro, 1924-1994, and Luck Joet, 1947-1994. Di Mambro belonged to EMORC from 1956 to 1968, which was probably the reason why the sect was counted among the offshoots or splinter groups of EMORC. AMORC is often also written a OAC and is an acronym for the Latin Antiquus Masticus Ordo Rosicrucis or Ancient and Mastic Order of the Rosy Cross. This is an organization founded in 1915 by Harvey Spencer Lewis in New York City which sees itself as the successor of the Rosicrucians. Furthermore, it refers to traditions that are said to go back to ancient Egypt. The Grand Lodge of the German-speaking countries has existed since March 1952 and has had its headquarters in Baden-Baden since 1963. It must be made clear that in the AMORC system no equivalence can be found to the apocalyptic special teachings and radicalizations of the Solar Templars. But since AMORC and thus the Rosicrucians must be mentioned, it is probably appropriate to say something about this order as well, namely that the term Rosicrucian German Rosenkreuzer is sometimes also called a written Rosenkreuzer in German, in which case this order is about actual or legendary mystical and secret societies, that is to say, secret associations which advocate a doctrine with alchemistic, hermetic, and Kabbalistic elements. The term Rosicrucian traces back to a man named Johann Valentin Andre, who lived from 1564 to 1654 and as the son of a pastor from Württemberg, was how could it be otherwise a theologian, mathematician and writer. As a writer, he created the literary figure Tristian Rosenkreutz, deriving this name from Andre's family coat of arms, which includes a st Andrew's cross and four roses. The coat of arms was designed by Andre's grandfather Jacob, namely based on Luther's coat of arms. 
Along with André, the solicitors Tobias He and Tristov Bissold were the most important members of the alliance. Within a circle of academic friends in Turbingen, the first three Rosicrucian writings were produced between 1614 and 1616 and were subsequently printed. One, Fama Fraternitatis, the tradition of the fraternity written in 1614. Two, Confession Fraternitatis, the avowal of the fraternity written in 1614. Three, Chemical Wedding. And regarding this matter, I have also copied the following from Wikipedia, with this brief letter being written by Andrei to Rudolf August of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. I have always and ever been driven by an incomprehensible mind with the desire to achieve and know more than was good for me. Meanwhile, however, I have explored all the science I have practiced, law and medicine, I have navigated my little ship across the high seas of history, and I have picked up six or seven languages. How many libraries did I search through, even though I possessed a library of 3,000 volumes myself, I have savored everything that provided mundane and spiritual education and also acquired some knowledge of music and the mechanical arts. Further, I have found the following in Wikipedia regarding the Rosicrucian Fellowship in the 18th century. The Rosicrucian movement exercised great influence on the Masonic secret society. The Order of the German Golden Cross and Rossi Cross, founded around 1760 in southern Germany, was Masonic. It was a mystery association on a magical Kabbalistic and alchemical basis. In the 20th century, other Rosicrucian fellowships emerged, for example, the Ancient and Mystical Order of the Rosicruces, EMORC, or the International School of the Golden Rosicross, Lectorium Rosicrucianum, in, uh, founded in 1924 in the Netherlands as Het Rosicruises Genotstap, registered in Germany since 1998. The Lectorium represents a Manichaean teaching originating in the wake of the Gnosis, thus teaching new Gnostic content. It is a secret society. The main emblem of the Lectorium Rosicrucianum already served for black magic summoning of demons in the Middle Ages. The Rosicrucians have the cross with the rose as their symbol. Its meaning is explained in Essay 17, published by the German Grand Lodge, EMORC, based in Baden-Baden, as follows the cross symbolizes the human body with outstretched arms as a greeting to the rising sun. The rose in the center of the cross represents the soul of the human being. It is this symbol that the Rosicrucians give the leitmotif to ad rosum per crucem ad crucem per rosum equals to the rose via the cross to the cross via the rose. Sun salutation the sun was and is worshipped in many cultures sometimes prayed to as God equivalent, for example in ancient Egypt. The sun salutation is also practiced in yoga. So this cross has nothing to do with the Tristian cross. The comprehension of Trist of the Rosicrucian orders knows neither grace nor forgiveness. But now let us continue with the Solar Templars, that is to say, the order of the Solar Temple. Formerly it was established only in 1984 under the official name Order International Chevalerisque de Tradition Solaire, but the real history of its foundation gets lost in diverse unclearnesses as do the biographies of the sect founders. In an almost impenetrable web of mystical temple traditions and syncretistic esotericism, everything gets lost in an environment of moving clubs and orders. When it comes to the founder Di Membro, he belonged to the French sect of the New Templars, in which there had already been an order sovereign du Temple, Solaire or Sovereign Order of the Solar Templars, since 1952, and then from 1970 on an order of du Temple, that is to say, the renewed order of the Templars. Then in the 1960s, Di Mambro made contact with Jacques Breyer, who in 1952 endeavored to bring about a reestablishment of the medieval order of the temple. 
Then it happened that Dimambro was accused of fraud in Mies in 1971 after which he moved to Animus near Geneva where he built up and operated a cultural center for relaxation as well as a yoga school in 1973. All of this then was the origin of his gaining his first Hangjason together with whom he purchased a house called Pyramide in Colombia-Sosold near Geneva. That was then also the place and the building where and in which the Temple of the Great White Universal Lodge was founded on 24th June 1976. This was followed by the establishment of the Golden Way Foundation in Geneva on the 12th of July 1978 in whose name the joint activities were coordinated under different names. Then the Sek Guru Di Mambro succeeded in lulling the conductor Mitchell Tabachnik, whom he had known since 1977 and who then chaired the whole thing as president from 1981. In the beginning gatherings took place only for cultural events and spiritual lectures while at this time however already about 800 members belonged to the order of the solar temple and this particularly from France and the French-speaking part of Switzerland. The organized Solar Templar Secret Society featured a sophisticated organizational structure and new an outer and an inner school in which case those and interested in the inner esoteric community were selected from the outer, the group which only a select circle was admitted to. Special rituals were organized by Dimambro in separate sanctuaries in which only members of the inner core group were allowed to participate. The inner sanctuaries were modeled on the esoteric lodges of France. By means of a sophisticated trick technique, Dimambro staged manifestations of higher wisdom during these inner ritual magical senses. He also legitimized his practices by claiming that he was supposedly acting at the behest of unknown superiors or masters in Zurich who could and would only maintain contact with him and with no one else. Then in 1982, the Belgian homeopathic Dr. Lutjot joined the sect and took over the marketing and management of the outer fraternity in which case everything was directed by de Mambro in such a form that the sect believers considered themselves modern Rosicrucian order members and were convinced to be incarnate Rosicrucians who had to complete the work of their predecessors. Thus the Solar Templars referred to the Order of the Templars founded in 1119 which was supposed to impart special powers and a secret knowledge that had been bestowed on them by occult means. In 1314 under King Philip the Fair 54 Templars were burned as heretics in France for living up to Templar ideals such as faithfulness, obedience and strict secrecy which also led to the Solo Templars remaining inconspicuous and unnoticed by the public for a long time. But I do not have to go into detail about what happened further on as the affair eventually led to the suicides in October 1994. Fifty-three charred bodies of the members of the Order of the Solar Temple were found, forty-eight in Switzerland and five in Canada, whereby they lost their lives, partly through injections and partly through gunshots. And as was explained to me at the time by you, Pleheronen, the whole thing took place in a similar form in Johnstown, just that there was murder as well as suicide. Then it so happened in France in December 1995 that the bodies of 16 Hangerson of the Solar Templar sect were found in the mountains southwest of Grenoble, which were also burnt and had gunshot wounds. These were then followed in March 1997 by two couples and a woman in the third suspected suicide of Solar Templars in Canada in which case however three children survived the tragedy. But I do not think I need to go into any more detail here because I have found some important information on Wikipedia that I would like to quote here and add to my explanations. I have also printed them out here for you to take with you and read them over. The pages you copied from Wikipedia have already been photocopied by Flora and handed over to me, so I do not need them again. Of course, I will read them. Accordingly, you can insert these pages into the conversation, and we can move on to other things. 
I see, so Florina did the groundwork again when she was here recently and did not turn off the computer again, which she was obviously using. So I will add the Wikipedia printout as quotes because on the one hand, they are important for this case and on the other hand, they are very interesting in terms of all the connections. Taken as a whole, they provide a deep insight into the delusional sectarianism that has been rampant for more than 2,000 years, especially within the so-called Christianity, and since its existence has triggered unbelievable deadly outgrowths of Azatomjin in humans, namely not only among Christians themselves as in no other religious sect but since time immemorial, also among those who are of another belief who persecute and murder believers in Trist. This is well known due to the renowned persecutions of Christians and the witch hunts, even if it is only stories to the humans of today which they do not care about in their all-embracing unconcernedness. And this is still the case today when considering the witch killings still taking place today in various places and countries, as well as the murder of those who are of another religion such as by the Islamist vermin who, imbued with hatred, murder Christians, Jews and Buddhists and so forth through assassinations and suicide attacks as well as believers in Islam who do not want to have anything to do with the Islamists and thus do not conform in any form to this refruff. And with that, everything necessary has been said, therefore the excerpt from Wikipedia with the remaining necessary explanations can be inserted here, although I suspect that this Wikipedia information is unlikely to have been published so extensively in the public media as a result of which the public was only fobbed off with brief sensational reports. The takeover of the Order of Du Temple and expansion the second head of the Solar Templar sect, Luck Jorat, assumed control of the New Templar Order, Order of Du Temple, ORT, co-founded by the French IMORC Grand Master Raymond Burnett in 1983 after the death of its leader Julian Oregas. Jorat transformed the Pseudo Templar ORT into a Rosicrucian secret lodge that was strictly directed towards him, the teaching of which was a potpourri of all kinds of esoteric, religious, and occult sources and was fed especially from the Theosophical and the Rosicrucian direction. Officially, the ORT, like other New Age organizations, advocated the age of Aquarius and preached love for the next one, the values of true Christianity and environmental protection. Internally, however, the members were step by step confronted with a secret teaching which propagated a light and power humanhood as a schooling goal and which thematized the great white lodge of Sirius, the seven beings of the great pyramid of Geyser and the servants of the Rosicrucian. Jorat became the Grand Master of the O.R.T. and introduced its members to the Order of the Solar Templars. Due to this merger, a group of hangers in Kubik, Canada also joined. This gave the Solar Templars a foothold in America. The order expanded its activities especially to France, Switzerland and Canada but also in Belgium, Luxembourg and Australia. In 1989, the expansion of the Solar Templars reached its apogee of 442 members, 187 in France, 90 in Switzerland, 86 in Canada, 53 in Martinique, 16 in the United States of America and 10 in Spain. These usually came from upper-middle-class circles and were physicians, technicians or artists, in some cases extremely affluent. Financial exploitation of religious motives in their idealism, the members uncritically followed their leaders' fixed visions of flight from the world and visions of rescue, and in addition to their freedom of decision, they also relinquished their money and assets to the two gurus who maintained a luxurious lifestyle. Unknown sums also flowed into not yet fully unveiled solar templar activities. The strong financial exploitation of the members was explained, among other things, by the fact that they would be among the 100 chosen families considered adequate to survive the expected end of the world in special enclaves, estates in France, Canada or Mauritius, to ensure the survival of humankind.
even after the apocalyptic ritual murders of the sect benefactors were found, who are said to have transferred more than 20 million Swiss francs to the order. The regular weekly contribution was 200 francs. The motto was the richer and more generous, the higher the rank in the hierarchy of the order. This hierarchy was absolutistically controlled by Dimambro and Joet. The ones who were able to pay less contributed more work performance. Look, Joet and Joseph Dimambro carried on an extensive trade in international real estate which was often bought cheap and sold above value. Consciousness control, nutrition, purity, compulsion, and worship the solar. Templars were vegetarians, ate only organically produced food, were considered refined and very mild in behavior. The cult members comprehended creation in its entirety and also saw the divine in the stones, plants, and animals. They tried to recognize the cosmic laws and principles of life and to live according to them. Grace and modesty were the central concerns of their teaching of salvation. Consciousness control. For the purpose of evidence, Dimambro, like Scientology founder Ron Hubbard, used a measuring device called a spectrograph for indoctrination. This device is said to have enabled 33 masters to itemize the auras and vibrations of all cult members. The depth psychological manipulation techniques of the sect leadership resulted in the formation of collective delusions, loss of reality, consciousness disturbances and childlike visions of paradise. Conditioned through radical consciousness control, the Hangerson of the Order were driven into a deadly illusory world, into emotional regression and increasingly into an end-time neurosis. Social Life and Cultural Affairs Dimambro ruled like a despot and regulated the social life of all members. Most of them continued to pursue their professions. Many solar templars joined together to form residential communities in mostly exclusive villas and manors. They maintained four to five edifications with meditations per day, often up to eight hours per meeting on Sundays. The working day of less privileged members began at four up. And the lab hour was exploited extensively. Wealthy people were induced to donate money. Dimambro separated couples and families as he saw fit and arranged new marriages by pairing members into cosmic couples according to mystical viewpoints. The anxiety about impurity was deliberately fueled, numerous ablutions were obligatory, one had to protect oneself against earth rays and other radiation and strict food taboos had to be observed. Phase of Radicalization The Grand Masters pose as occult superhumans between 1979 and 1981. Locke, Jowett and Joseph Dimambro assumed the leadership of the Order of the Solar Templars. Both claimed a godlike position and surrounded themselves with the nimbus of being occult superhumans. Thus the homeopath Jowett, for example, was considered a miracle healer, and Dimamro presented himself as the Grand Master of the Order of the Sola Temple with magical abilities and staged himself as the reincarnation of Osiris, Moses, and of a medieval night monk. Joet developed an active propaganda and lecture activity, mostly on health topics. He performed as a healer who demanded gratitude after success. Dimambro acted as the mysterious Grand Master with magical abilities who wielded the sword Excalibur or directed cosmic powers through another medieval knightly sword. In teaching in relation to Theosophy and Spiritistic Rosicrucian ideas, Dimambro's writings show equivalence to the Theosophical schools of Elias and Bailey and Annie Besant. The Solar Templars derived their worldview from all kinds of esoteric religious and occult sources, but above all from the modern theosophy of the medium Helena Blavatsky in the same elitist Rosicrucian direction, which claimed to possess an exclusive knowledge of an actually existing but just invisible secret Rosicrucian fraternity, as whose earthly representatives they saw themselves. From Blavatsky they derived the idea of a white brotherhood, a circle of astrally ascended masters who, according to Dimambro, 
were based in the actual command center of the Sala Templars in Zurich and on the Stasaris. Di Mambro and Jort repeatedly referred to themselves as incarnations of ascended masters, among them Jesus and Moses. The syncretistic doctrine of the Sala Templars was compiled by Jort and Di Mambro. It results from apocalyptic special teachings and radicalizations that partly form the myth, which is theoretically based on the same perception strand of Rosicrucian ideas, in which the, again invisible, elder brothers of the Rosicrucian are mentioned by name as a part of a supernatural brotherhood. In the Manifestos of the Solar Templars, an esoteric reference was made to the Pyramid of Chips at Geza, to a great invisible white brotherhood, to the Holy Grail and to the Arthurian legend, and developed into a mixture of medieval mystery beliefs, Grail Christianity, astrology, New Age, rebirth views and nature religion. Each member was defined as a reincarnation of a historical or legendary personality who had an old debt to pay or played a role in further salvation history. Di Mambro made the members euphorient by revealing to them what important personalities they had been in past lives. Among them were the female pharaoh Hatshepsut, the queen of Atlantis and the biblical figure Joshua. Apocalyptic Teaching of Salvation The apocalyptic direction towards Di Mambro's teachings of salvation intensified as the millennium approached. While Di Mambro originally announced the peaceful end time going over into a mystic paradise to the cult members thanks to their spiritual mode of life, which they would experience in an earthly form, the end time visions changed radically in the 1990s increasingly, the consciousness of the members of the order was now formed by persecution anxieties. Those who were sufficiently spiritually evolved would obeying the plan of the invisible hierarchy, voluntarily leave the earth in order to enter the absolute dimension of truth in the Tristian fire and thus escape the destiny of the destruction of the depraved world. Together with his mistress, Di Mamro had a daughter named Emmanuel, who was to be educated as a cosmic child to become an avatar or messiah. She grew up completely isolated, no one except the nanny Nikki Duda was even allowed to come near her. Later, a little boy who was considered the antitrust was regarded as her antipode. Spiritualistic impostures and slates of hand Di Mambo's daughter Alay, who later lost her life in the massacres, publicly reported on the slates of hand her father used to lead his hangers and to believe in his supernatural abilities. These cheatings and tricks were corroborated shortly afterwards by Antoine Dutoit, Di Mambo's closest confidant. Thus, the cult leader regularly transfixed his hangers and with installations of tricks during the rituals in the darkened sanctuary. When religious ones were initiated, he made astral masters appear in the flesh. On this occasion, he presented himself with a sword that is said to have once belonged to King Arthur, from the blade of which he made lightning flash by means of hidden electronic devices. Under his black ceremonial robe, the sect leader carried a remote control that enabled them to secretly open automatic doors and trigger lighting bolts. He could make the Holy Grail appear on a hill at the touch of a butt. Shifting into contempt for the world and felony, Di Mambro was under investigation for cheating and jort for arms trafficking. For a long time, both had been teaching, death in itself does not exist, it is only an illusion. I based on this belief foundation, the strategy to survive the end of the world was now radically changed. Transit to Sirius In 1994, the human contemptuous barbarity of the teaching escalated with the intention of being reborn in the Sirius star system after a collective death in order to found a new humanity there. Proclamation of the Rosicrucian Orleans and announcement of a Rosicrucian journey in 1991, the hard core of the Order of the Sala Templars proclaimed the so-called Rosicrucian Alliance. In 1994, the Swiss conductor Michel Tabachek announced during a lecture in Grenoble that the Sala Templars, Rosicrucians would soon embark on a journey. Just ten days later, 
The bodies of 53 Sala Templars were recovered in Switzerland and Canada. Four massacres in 1994, 1995 and 1997. In 1994, 1995 and 1997, a total of 74 Sala Templars lost their lives in collective acts of murder and suicide, some of them drugged and shot, some intoxicated, partly by their own hand. The legal criminal offenses were murder, killing on demand and suicide. After the death of the two sect leaders Dimambro and Jot Tabaknik, whose wife died in the 1994 suicides, was suspected of being the new Grand Master of the Sola Templars. Murder of the Antichrist, Massacre No. 1 on 30th September 1994 The drama was triggered by a trifle the first name of a newborn. The couple Nicky and Antoine Dutut, who looked after the two houses of Jarrett and Dimambro in Canada, baptized their son Christopher Emmanuel in July 1994. This enraged the cult leader Dimambro, whose daughter Emmanuel, supposedly mystically conceived with his mistress Dominic Bellaton, 36, was considered a cosmic child whom outsiders, except Nicky, were allowed to approach within a maximum of 10 meters so as not to disturb her aura. Before that, the Dudits got wise to the imposter tricks and clandestine light effects of Dimambro's spiritual superworld. At that, Dimambro announced that the baby Tristopher Emmanuel was the Antichrist, who was endangering the spiritual future of the Order, and sent the Swiss Joel Eggers, 35, along with Dominic Bellaton from Zurich to Montreal on 29th September 1994 in order to murder the Dudwit family. In the Canadian sect center of Morin Heights, the caretaker Antoine Dutoit was then murdered by Joel Eggers on 30 September 1994, with 50 knife stabs symbolizing the 50 sect hangers and who was supposed to die at their members' behest. With eight knife stabs as a symbol of the eight loss of the Sala Templars, Dominic Bellaton killed Dutoit's wife Nikki. Subsequently, she stabbed the three-month-old son Christopher Emmanuel of the Dudwitz who had been declared the Antichrist to death with six knife thrusts and pierced his heart several times. Eggers and Bellaton flew back to Switzerland and two other Sala Templars living in Canada removed all traces of the ritual murder and hid the bodies in a cupboard. On the night of 4th October 1994, these two helpers ingested the drug benzodiazepine and set fire to the estate with a time fuse. Both of them died in the flames. Massacre number 2 on 4th and 5th October, 1994 On the night of 5th October, 1994, a total of 48 members of the Sala Templars lost their lives in murders and suicides. The autopsy revealed that 15 of them committed suicide. Seven were executed as traitors and the rest were assisted in dying. In a farmstead in the hamlet of Cherry in the Swiss canton of Freiburg, the Volunteer Fire Brigade found 23 dead persons wrapped in golden and white cult robes, 18 of whom were aligned in a circle as if symbolous in rays of sunshine. The bodies, including Tabachnik's first wife, lay in a sort of chapel with mirrored walls and bright red cloth panels of fabric beneath a painting of Trist. Some heads were wrapped in bent bags, others wore gowns. After the massacre in Cherry, Joet and Dimambro drove to Granger sur Salvin in the Swiss canton of Valais, about 50 kilometers south of Montreux, where a chalet was on fire three hours later. On the morning of 6 October, the fire brigade found the charred remains of 25 human beings in the debris, among them five children and the leadership around Jort and Dimambro, his cosmic child Emmanuel and its Swiss mother Dominic Bellaton. The former member Thierry Huggenen warned of further massacres among the Solar Templars. Arrests and criticism of the investigations in Switzerland. Investigations begin in Switzerland. France and Canada. Three Sala Templars who had been spotted in Granger Chasselva the day before the Chalet fire were arrested Patrick Fournet, who sent the bequest letters of the sect leaders, 
and the two French gendarmes Jean-Pierre Ladenchet and Patrick Rostand. The coroner Pilla, however, saw no sufficient reason for an arrest warrant, set the trio free again in reason, nothing, absolutely nothing indicated that set members that I had interrogated would pick up the torch and instigate another massacre. I, this proved to be an error of judgment. The barrister for the joint plaintiffs, Jack was barreling, criticized the fact that Lodinchet had not at least been observed and wiretapped which might have prevented the massacres the following year, and accused the Swiss investigation authorities of making a misdiagnosis. Massacre number 3 on 23rd December, 1995 On 23rd December, 1995, 16 charred bodies were found 30 kilometers southwest of Grenoble near St. Pierre de Trans on a hillside plateau. In the so-called Hell Hole, arranged in a circle like the spokes of a wheel. The feet of the doomed men and woman pointed to a funeral pyre in the middle. Forensic pathologists had ascertained that 14 of the victims, as in Cherry, had been injected with an anesthetic before being killed with head shots and set on fire. The bodies of the two group leaders lay apart, and near the two pistols used for the act. Even the defense did not contradict the prosecution's realization that the sect hangers and were murdered in part. The chief prosecutor of Grenoble said that the eleven Sala Templars and three children were shot dead by the gendarme Lodinchet and an assistant. Black plastic bags were pulled over the victims' heads. Afterwards, the two perpetrators doused themselves with a fire accelerant and shot themselves with the duty pistols of the gendarmes. The Forensic Institute described the mass murder, which the Sola Templars bizarrely called a transit, as a ritual carnage. Lydenchet's two daughters were among the 16 dead. Massacre number 4 on 22nd March 1997 On 22nd March 1997, five bodies were recovered by the fire brigade after a fire alarm in a burning country house in St. Casima. Kubik slash Canada. Three young persons, who had been drugged, escaped from an annex. The rescued girl and the two boys, aged 13, 14, and 16, reported that their parents, along with three other solid Templars, had made the journey to the planet Cirrus, and that this was already their second attempt, as there had been mishaps during the first transit. The parents went to their deaths without having arranged for the care of their children, who had been drugged before. Also this last cult drama was richly staged. The five Sala Templars lost their lives at the beginning of spring on the day of the equinox and set the house on fire with a time fuse. Testament of the Rosicrucian The members left behind testamentary press releases manifestos and two videotapes inscribed with the title Testament of the Rosicrucian to the Shock World Public, on which the Sola Templars who had lost their lives in the collective murder and suicide actions printed the message we, faithful servants of the Rosy Cross, declare just as we will be gone some day, we will return, for the Rosy Cross is immortal. We are equal to it from time immemorial, and forever. A businessman and professional golfer Patrick Vuanet, 16th of December, 1995, whose father Jean Vuanet, the former Olympic sky racing champion of 1960, knew of his son's and his own wife's entanglement with the apocalyptically directed Sala Temple sect, delivered the last bequest letter of the chosen ones Joet and Dimambro to the French home secretary Charles Pasqua. It stated, I want you to know that where we will be, we will always reach out our arms to those who will be worthy to come to us. Investigations and Trial The investigation authorities were able to prove that 38 of the 53 Sala Templars who died in Canada and Switzerland were murdered. The four and six found morphine and the phytotoxin cure air in all the corpses. The shooters and the perpetrators who administered the anesthetic syringes could not be identified. 
The Chief Prosecutor Lawrence spoke of unknown masterminds in the background and of potential clients for further Templar murders and initiated a search for three Mercedes limousines with Swiss license plates that had been seen near the crime scene. After the ritual murders of the Sala Templars, Michel Tabechnik, a well-known conductor with Swiss and French passports, was suspected of being the new Grand Master of the Sala Templars, which he denied. Tabechnik was charged with membership of a criminal organization, but was acquitted for lack of evidence. Arrest and Indictment 2001 Michel Tabachnik was arrested in Nantua near Paris on 11 June 1996 and charged with membership of a criminal organization before the criminal court in Grenoble in 2001. The prosecutor had demanded five years in prison without parole. The counsel for the defense pleaded for acquittal. He had been classified as a theorist of the sect and the number three in its hierarchy. Since he could not be proven to be jointly responsible for the sectarian massacres due to a lack of evidence, he was acquitted in the first instance on 25 June 2001. Concretely, this trial was about the ritual murders between 1994 and 1997 in which a total of 74 sect members lost their lives, and in which case the prosecution had accused Tabachnik of co-responsibility for all 74 ritual murders. Appeal Proceedings 2006 Re-examinations of the victims from 1995 are said to have revealed unusually high levels of false furos in the bodies. Alain Voinet, a son of Jean and Edith Voinet, concluded from that that the Solar Templars had been murdered by means of flamethrowers and, together with the prosecution, obtained an appeal process against Tabachek. In 2006, the prosecution in Grenoble initiated the appeal process and accused Tabachnik of having called for a flight to Sirius, that is to say suicide, in his writings, thus kindling a deadly dynamism among the Sala Templars. Concretely, the lawsuit was about the ritual murders of 16 Sala Templars, among them three children, in December 1995 in the Verkus Massif near Grenoble. The defense did not contradict the prosecution's realization that some of the sect Hangerson had been murdered. The appeal tribunal also acquitted Tabachnik of the charge of participating in a criminal organization. Conspiracy theories in the media The German magazine Stern published an article as early as January 1996 which saw the Sala Templars in connection with a network of conspiratorial connections. Since 1970, the esoteric order is said to have been infiltrated by the radical right-wing secret society service Daction Civic, SEC. The Stern quoted Massimo Introvin saying that it was likely that the uh, it had been a religiously cloaked front organization of right-wing extremists. When the Sala Templars got out of control, the secessionists were relentlessly eliminated. The British journalists David Carr Brown and David Cohen established links between the group and the following individuals Jean Lois Masson, August 1982, school friend and financial consultant to Prince Rainier of Monaco, Princess Gracia Patricia of Monaco, Grace Kelly, 14th September 1982, Colette Durrell, French female singer, Female friend of Gracia Masson is said to have taken Princess Gracia to Lock Joet in mid-1982 for a treatment that consisted of acupuncture and several rather dubious practices. Joet is said to have charged 20 million francs for it, which he in fact did not receive. The princess had then died in a mysterious car accident. A film by Carl Brown and Cohen was aired on Channel 4 in Great Britain in 1997 and sparked indignation from the international tabloid press who saw the memory of Grace Kelly Besmerch. Conspiracy theories blossomed first they wanted to make the Grimaldis untrustworthy before the people, then to push Monaco into the hands of France. In Germany, the serious media did not take up the news. And since the public media only published short sensational reports, 
but never the entire true state of affairs with regard to any issues and happenings. The population learns little if anything at all regarding the effective backgrounds and connections and simply the effective truth. This is also a factor of the fact that among the populations around the globe, not only a horrendous disorientation with regard to world happenings exists and is increasingly promoted, but that this also causes an unconcernedness in every respect. And this unconcernedness also involves the catastrophic sectarianism that, with its deep human advices, pervades all religions, namely quite especially the so-called Christian religion with all its hundreds of blatantly dumb primitive sects of all kinds, which have also crept into the philosophies, esotericism, theosophy, and philanthropy, and so forth. Except from the 684th contact of Saturday, 8th July 2021 between Pataha and Billy.